Let's get started with a very brief introduction to physics. The word physics itself comes to us from the ancient Greek, and it means nature. The word physics translates as nature. Now, in modern times, the word nature has a connotation of uh, things like being out on a lake or out in the woods, dealing with bugs, mountain ranges, and ocean beaches, things like that. But in the physics context, the word nature is much more broad. It refers to the natural world. In other words, the universe that we live in. And specifically, the world we live in, the universe we live in, is governed by laws. There are rules about what's allowed. And physics is all about trying to understand what those rules and laws are and how we can apply them for the betterment of our lives. Now, according to Wikipedia, physics is defined as the natural science that involves the study of matter and its motion through time and space, along with related concepts such as energy and force. We're going to be developing all of these concepts as, and many others as we go through two semesters of physics. So it's going to be quite the ride. Now, we just said that physics is a natural science. And, you know, there are other branches of the natural sciences. There's chemistry, there's biology and geology and meteorology and many others. But all of these things are examples of sciences. So what's a science? So that's really what I want to talk about in this video, about science in general, and then we'll narrow it down to physics as we go later on. Now, you probably have some ideas about what science are. You actually know the actual definition, but you might not remember it. But you have seen it before, I promise you. But let's just talk about a few things. So first of all, uh, on this slide we have measurements are the basis of scientific research and investigation. We measure things in science, and we have to figure out what can be measured and how can we measure it, and what does it tell us, and what does it tell us about itself, and what does it tell us about other things. But at the heart of all sciences are the, is the process of measuring. Now, we live in a universe, we live in this natural world where things happen, and we can observe them. We use our senses, and we observe different things. And so we see something happening in, na happening in nature, and we want to know, how did that happen? Or why did that happen? These are the fundamental questions that science seeks to answer. Now, there is a fundamental assumption that we make in science. The idea is that our universe is orderly and that it can be understood. If you start out from a philosophical framework that the universe is not orderly, everything is random, we can't understand anything, then... You, you shouldn't even try to do science. It's worthless. It can't work. But it turns out if you make the assumption that the universe is actually kind of an orderly place and that we can make sense of it, it turns out we can make sense of a lot of it. There's still a lot of things we don't know. There's still a lot of things that we haven't figured out. There are a lot of things we haven't even, you know, there are things we don't even know that we don't know them yet. But there's so much that we do understand now, and our growth in our understanding has been tremendous. Even in the last few years, uh, the amount that we have learned about the world we live in has increased incredibly. And it's through the process of science that that has happened. Here we have an image of one of the most important scientists that you've probably never heard of. His name was Ibn al Haytham. Um, that's kind of hard to pronounce, maybe. In the West, we usually just refer to him as Al-Hazan. Al-Hazan was a Muslim scholar who lived about a thousand years ago. And around the year 1000 AD, he published his Book of Optics. It was a seven-volume work which basically he studied light. He studied how light behaves in the natural world, and he studied the physics of light. He developed the mathematics that describes how, how light works. He even went into the psychology of perception, things like color. It was an absolutely monumental work, and it was one of the first major scientific works ever written that we still know about. And uh, in it, he laid out the process by which he made his scientific discoveries. And today, we call that process the scientific method. Now, I told you earlier that you probably already knew the definition of a science, and 
you learned it back in third grade or whatever. That's what it is. A science is something, it's a process that follows the steps and the procedures of the scientific method. And so I said this guy was a really important scientist, and the reason for that is because he's the guy that actually developed the method by which science is done. So I think that's kind of important. You may or may not agree, but uh, I'm pretty confident that I'm right. So let's talk about the scientific method. It's a method of observation and reasoning and making predictions. And really, it's about organizing the process of solving problems. Now, if you pick up 20 different introductory science textbook, an introductory chemistry book, biology, geology, physics, whatever, somewhere probably there's going to be a section at the beginning about the scientific method because the scientific method is how science is done. And you'll see very often a list of steps. You know, you make an observation, you state the question, you form a hypothesis, hypothesis which makes a prediction. Then you do experiments to test the hypothesis. You analyze your data. You form a conclusion, and from that conclusion, you form a theory, and then you can repeat as necessary. And this is how it's often presented, and I don't really like the way this is presented very much because, well, the problem with it is it looks kind of like a recipe. It's like I do this step, I do that step, and then poof, out pops science. Just bake in the oven for 30 minutes and your science is done. It doesn't really work that way because – you don't always start with an observation. You might start with data or you might start with a theory. You might start with something else. And the whole process is iterative. It's like a cycle. You do it over and over and over. And each time you do it, you refine things so that your knowledge is made more precise and more clear. So I found this image on the Google and I will put a link to where you can find the image in the, find the, image in the PowerPoint. But... Basically, I like this conception of the scientific method a lot better because it's got basically the same steps, but it's showing you that there's a process. And you, know, you might have to go through this process several times before you get to your final results. But, you know, you can start anywhere. You can start here. You can start there. You can start there. Wherever you want to start, and just, you just go through this cycle over and over again, doing experiment, making tests, making predictions, and refining it based on your results. Now, there's another concept that's very important in science, and it's the idea of making a model. Our experiments, we don't say that our experiments give us truth. We say that our experiments lead us to building models. We create representations or models that explain what we observe in our experiments. Now, sometimes you can perform an experiment and there can be multiple possible explanations that fit what you observe, that fit the data, that fit what you test. And so the only way that you can determine which of them is correct is to come up with more experiments, uh, one that can rule out one but not the other. But there is a rule of thumb that scientists often use, and sometimes you'll hear this mentioned. And so I just wanted to cover it in case you ever heard this before, you would know what it is. It's called... Occam's razor. And the idea is this. Let's say I observe something in, may, in, in the world and I come up with a theory to explain it. And then someone else comes up with a theory to explain it. And we want to know which theory is the better theory. Well, the answer is, of course, you do the scientific method, you conduct experiments, you do tests. But there is a rule of thumb and it's called Occam's razor. And it's a suggestion. It's not 100% true, but it turns out very often it is true. The idea is that if you've got two competing theories, the theory that is simpler, the theory that explains what you see in a more elegant way, is probably closer to being correct than the one that's more convoluted. Now, obviously, it's, this is just a rule of thumb. It's not always true. You have to do the experiment to, sh to know for sure which one is correct and which one isn't correct. But when you're trying to decide maybe which one to try first, you might want to try the simpler one first because it's going to be more likely to, to be correct. So we can talk about some of these steps in a little bit more detail. We have some phenomenon of nature and we either observe it or we have some theory about it that makes some predictions. So we form a hypothesis to explain what is observed or what is predicted. We design an experiment to test. And that's the key word here, testing. 
That is the heart of the scientific method. We do an experiment to test. That's really what makes a scientific belief different from a philosophical belief or a religious belief or some other kind of belief. You can have faith in a religious belief that is untested. In fact, faith is very often, religious faith is often about questions to which we can't know the answer. But scientific beliefs are, by their very nature, they're always beliefs that have been put to the test. You have to test them through experiment for them to be science. If it's not tested, it's not science, it's something else. Now, once you do your test, you get data from your experiment, and then you can analyze the data. And from the analysis of those results, your hypothesis may be adjusted. You may reject it, say, oh, these data contradict what I thought was going to happen. Or, hey, I was right. I'm going to accept the hypothesis. You know, and then we do more experiments and more experiments. So... I've used that word hypothesis, and I think you probably have a general idea of uh, what the word means, but let's talk a little bit about examples of what makes a good hypothesis compared to a bad hypothesis. Because if you're going to do a scientific experiment, you have to have a well-formed hypothesis that can be tested. So let's look at uh, some examples. Example number one as a good hypothesis, plants will grow taller when given miracle grow. If I have a couple of identical plants and I give one of them miracle grow and I mix it into the soil, I expect it to grow taller than if I have, you know, a plant with the same kind of soil but without the miracle grow. Now, that's a pretty well-formed hypothesis. I can test that. I can get two plants that are very similar to each other. I can treat one of them with miracle grow, let the other one not be treated with miracle grow as sort of a control on the experiment. And then I can let them both go under the same conditions for a while, the same amount of sunlight, the same amount of water, and see if the hypothesis is true. Now, down below you can see an example of a badly formed hypothesis. Plants will grow better when given miracle grow. We're not sure what the word better means. It's a very poorly formed hypothesis. Maybe better means brighter color, or maybe better means more leaves, or maybe better means something else. It's nebulous what you mean, so it's a very poorly worded hypothesis. It's not really, you can't really test what better is. But taller, I could literally get out a meter stick and measure how tall the plant has grown. So that's something that I can measure. It's a, something that I can test. And so when you form a hypothesis, you have to know that science is all about testing. That's the central idea. Can we test it? And so you have to form your hypothesis in such a way that it can be tested. Then once you have your hypothesis, you want to form an experiment. The experiment is the means by which you test the hypothesis. And you want to make sure that it's under controlled condition to determine if the results support or confirm the hypothesis. Now, if you get one idea out of this little video, I'm going to tell you the most important idea that I'm going to give you about doing an experiment. And I mentioned it kind of a little bit on the previous slide when I was talking about the plant. You can only change one thing at a time. If I have two plants and I give one plant more miracle grow and more water, for example, and I see that plant grows taller, I don't know if it grew taller because of the miracle grow or if it grew taller because of the extra water. And so I need to have a controlled experiment where only one thing is different so that I can say, oh, this is the outcome. Sometimes that's a lot easier said than done, by the way. Sometimes it's very hard to only have one thing changing, but that's the ideal. You want to have only one thing change so you can say, okay, I change this and I get a result, so I know that's the thing that caused the result. Also, experimental results need to be able to be duplicated by other researchers. As I make this video, um, there was a very important scientific announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago about a new class of high temperature superconductors and uh, it was very exciting people like oh this would be amazing if it works but so far the results of those scientists haven't been duplicated so a lot of people are very skeptical and maybe it, it didn't work the way they said so after all so 
you know, that's something that's really important in science is that not only do you get a result, but it has to be a result that you can duplicate and that other people can duplicate as well. But no concept, no model of nature is going to be valid unless the predictions it makes are in agreement with the experimental results. The results from your experiment, those are your test, whether or not you've got it right or not. So here it is again, in all caps, the key to the scientific method is testing. The ability to test what you are doing is what makes something a science. And so if something cannot be tested via an experiment, it's not science. Do you believe in the tooth fairy? Can you prove that the tooth fairy doesn't exist? No. That's not something, you can't prove a negative like that. You can't prove that the tooth fairy doesn't exist. Maybe somewhere in some corner of the universe, there's a tooth fairy. And maybe she was here many years ago and she went away. Who knows? You can't prove it, right? I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but you can't prove a negative like that. But if I make a statement that says, hey, I believe the tooth fairy exists, I need to be able to provide evidence to back that claim up if I want to make it be a scientific belief. I have to be able to test it, maybe set a trap or something and catch the tooth fairy. Somehow I've got to do some kind of test that proves that the tooth fairy exists if I want to make the claim. Now, I'm not making that claim, by the way, but I'm just you know making the point that you can't prove a negative, but if you do assert something scientifically, you have to have some test that can back it up. Otherwise, what you're talking about is some flight of fancy. It's not science. So here's that experiment I was talking about. How do we design a good experiment? I've got two plants that are basically the same, and I've got them potted with the same kind of soil, and I'm going to put them under the same light, and I'm going to feed one of them miracle Grow, and the other one is not. And I'm going to let them go for some time. The only difference between these two plants is that one, plant A, is given miracle Grow, and plant B is not. That's a well-designed experiment. You can do that experiment as like a science fair project with your kids if you want. And the reason it's a well-designed experiment is because we have all the variables kept constant except the one we're testing. That's called the controlled variable. And so when we talk about scientific experiments, we generally talk about independent variables and dependent variables. The independent variable is the one variable that you're changing. In this case, it would be the amount of miracle grow. It's the thing that you're manipulating or changing to see if there's a result. The dependent variables are the things that change as a result. Maybe it's the height of the plant. Maybe it's how long an experiment lasts. You know, it could be anything could be a dependent variable, but it's, it's the one that changes as a result of what you do. You're only changing one thing. You're keeping everything else the same, and you change one thing as you do the experiment. If you get a different result of the experiment, that different result is the dependent variable. It's dependent on what you did. What you did is the independent thing. So we might let our plant grow over several days, and we can measure using a ruler its height in centimeters. And so we might say, Plant A, after a few days, is at 10 centimeters, and plant B is at 7, and plant B is at 25 and 15 a few days later. And we can plot this out as a table. And this kind of table, when organized, lets us see trends in how the data is moving. Is the data increasing? Is it decreasing in value? Is it behaving according to some function like a sine wave? These are things that we can see in the numbers. And it can be especially easy to see them if we graph them. And so here we have some graphs of the height in centimeters of plant A versus the time. And we can see that plant A not only is growing more, but at a higher slope. And so we can see things from these graphs that not just that it has grown higher, but that it's growing faster as well because of that slope. This kind of visual representation of data is very, very useful, and we'll make use of it a lot in our class as well. Now, after you do lots of experiments about something, you might find some fundamental relationship in nature. 
And in that case, these are things that are typically typically called laws. An example of this is the law of conservation of mass. And what the law of conservation of mass tells us that during a chemical reaction, no gain or loss of mass will occur. So, for example, if I take two hydrogen atoms and combine them with an oxygen atom, I'll make a water molecule, H2O. The mass of that water molecule will be the same as the mass of the individual atoms that made it up. There'll be no change in the mass. That's what the law of conservation of mass tells us, and that has been seen by literally millions and millions of experiments detailing chemical reactions. It's always found to be true. It seems very fundamental in nature. But when we talk about laws, we have to know when they apply because there are certain interactions involving the nucleus of the atoms. Those are called nuclear reactions. Chemical reactions deal with the electrons. You know, the electrons that are going around the atoms. Nuclear reactions deal with the protons and the neutrons inside the nucleus. And when you have nuclear reactions with different atoms, the mass can change. It can be converted into energy. We'll see that later. And so uh, the law of conservation of mass, it's valid during chemical reactions, but it's not valid during nuclear reactions. And so just be aware that when we talk about these scientific laws, we have to know under what conditions they apply. And it's also worth noting that often when we talk about scientific laws, they simply state the behavior. They don't try to explain it necessarily. Why doesn't the mass change when we have chemical reactions? Well, it doesn't matter why it doesn't change. You know, we might be able to figure that out. We might know it, in fact. But in terms of stating the law, it, it's a superfluous detail. It doesn't matter. Now, if something isn't fundamental in its relationship of nature, um, we still can often see results that we form into theories. And so a theory is kind of like a law, but it's not as strong. There's not as much evidence. It's not fundamental to the very structure of the universe, as it were. You know, a law is kind of like a theory on steroids. You know, it's very, very strong. But um, theories themselves have to be tested. And so in order for them to be tested, when you make a theory to explain something, it has to be falsifiable. That's a fancy word, and it's thrown out a lot in science. It just means it has to be something that you can test. Either it's correct or it's not correct. And so you have to be able to test it. And it's very important to know that theories can be changed if new evidence presents itself. When we talk about the theory of gravity later on, we'll see that there was a very successful theory of gravity that was developed by Isaac Newton, and it worked brilliantly for years, but it turned out that there were situations that it couldn't explain. The theory wasn't valid in certain situations, and it took Albert Einstein to figure out what was going on, and Einstein actually came up with an entirely new theory of gravity. It's way more complicated than Newton's, but it turns out that under certain circumstances, that Einstein's very complicated theory turns into Newton's more simple theory. Mathematically speaking, the formula simplifies. And so if you were doing something involving gravity, if Newton's theory would give you the correct answer, we still use it all the time because it's way simpler. But sometimes Newton's theory doesn't give the correct answer and we have to use Einstein's theory of gravity. And in that case, it's more complicated, but it's necessary to get the right answer. Now, we didn't throw out Newton's theory necessarily because it's still valid, but sometimes theories are proven to be wholly incorrect, and if that's the case, then we would throw it out. And that leads us to the conclusion of this lecture. You know, for hundreds of years, there was a theory of gravity developed by Isaac Newton, and it worked brilliantly it was used to make many discoveries and to explain many things that we see in the universe around us. But there were things that it couldn't explain. And so once we could not explain those things, we had to develop a new theory. There's always a possibility that something that is very well established will be proven to be 
incomplete, that we won't fully understand something, and there'll need to be some new theory later on to explain what we don't understand yet. That's not a bug. It's, it's a feature. It's a feature of science that science gets better. Our understanding of things improves. And that's a very important part of the scientific process.